Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm here on behalf of the PTA board to welcome you to the Meet the Candidates Night. We're so pleased to have all of you join us this evening to learn more about each of our candidates. This year, there are two seats available on the Board of Education. The four candidates running are Zaid El-Jamal, Sasha Hayes, Barbara Parmley, and Miranda Zoki. We thank each candidate for their interest in these positions and look forward to learning more about you this evening. The PTA has traditionally hosted this evening, but we are not required to do so per our bylaws. The PTA hosted the, in the meeting to ensure that the community has the opportunity to meet all of the candidates and to hear their positions on the various issues that the board will be facing. It is unlikely that we will be hosting this meeting next year, which will provide other community members with the opportunity to arrange and host the event. We worked tirelessly to arrange a moderator through the League of Women Voters, but they were unable to provide someone due to conflicting schedules on their end. In addition to reaching out to the League of Women Voters, we also contacted the Tompkins Corners Cultural Center, Town Hall, the Lake Peekskill Civic Association, former school board members from neighboring towns, and the list goes on. With that said, we are very grateful that we have secured someone with such wonderful experience to moderate this event. Thank you to Janine Rufo for her willingness to participate at the moderator, as the moderator this evening. Janine has lived in Cortland Manor in the Putnam Valley School community with her family for over 23 years. Ms. Rufo attended Rutgers University, earned her master's in social work from Hunter College. Mrs. Rufo worked in several capacities as a social worker throughout her career, and this year is completing her 20th year as a school social worker with the Nyack Public Schools. Mrs. Rufo has been involved and a dedicated parent, community member, and taxpayer. We welcome this, the experience that she brings to us tonight as moderator. We'd also like to thank our timekeeper, Mark Carson, for his willingness to participate and keep time this evening. The moderator will ask the questions that have been submitted. Any questions that were previously submitted through the anonymous survey will not be used, so please be sure to submit the questions via index cards that were provided tonight. We will be collecting cards throughout the evening and we'll be passing them on to our moderator. We thank you for attending and for your interest in this election and the upcoming budget vote. Please be sure to vote on May 21st at the Putnam Valley Elementary School cafeteria. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Again, I'm Janine Rufo, and it is a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, before we begin, I would like to ask that we all stand and salute our flag with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to thank the Putnam Valley PTA for their long-standing tradition of hosting this opportunity for the community to ask questions of and learn about the candidates who are interested in serving on the Board of Education here in the Putnam Valley School District. I would also like to thank members of the League of Women Voters for providing guidance in an organizing this event and outlining the process we will follow tonight and taking all of my phone calls the last week. Um, scheduling conflicts did not allow them to be here themselves. Tonight's event is being recorded for presentation on YouTube, and the link to the presentation will be available on the Putnam Valley uh, website, which is www.pvcsd.org within the next, Dan, 48 hours or so? Okay. Um, at this time, I would like to ask all in attendance to turn off or silence your cell phones so that we can be fully respectful and present for these proceedings. There are four candidates running for two available Board of Education seats. Each seat is for a three-year term, which will begin on July 1st, 2024. It is my pleasure now to introduce our four candidates who have put themselves forward to be considered as trustee of the Board of Education. I've already apologized, but I will do so again in advance for any mispronunciations mispronunci or other errors that I inevitably will make tonight. So the candidates are Zaid, I see, El Jamel. El Jamal. El Jamal. El Jamal. Barbara Parmley, yep. Sasha Hayes, and Miranda Zoki. Our timekeeper tonight is Mark Carson. He will notify each candidate when there are 30 seconds remaining in their uh, period of questioning with the, by holding up a yellow sign and when their time is up by holding up a red sign. Each candidate will begin our evening with three minutes for their opening remarks 
and two minutes for closing remarks after the question period of the evening. Seating order was chosen by lottery this evening just before we started. The order of speaking will rotate with each question so that everybody has a chance to be the first, second, third, and fourth to answer a question. Closing remarks will be conducted in the reverse order of opening remarks. Questions were submitted tonight in writing on index cards. The questions will be vetted throughout the, or, or reviewed throughout the evening because there are so many and we do all uh, not plan on being here all evening. I am going to do my best to consolidate the questions, like all the budget questions, all of the you know, questions of that nature. Um, I do want to say that um, please ensure, and I see that they mostly are, that the questions will address the position of Board of Education and not any personal questions. And in that right, all questions will be answered by all candidates. So if there are questions that specifically speak to a particular candidate, I will phrase it in such a way that all um, candidates will have that opportunity to answer each question. Uh, throughout the evening, if you don't think we have enough questions, feel free, or if something sparks you and really, you really want to get that answered, please um, bring that up or give it to one of our wonderful ladies raising their hands in the back and they will bring it up to me. It is anticipated that the forum will end about 8.30, 9 o'clock, which will allow for opening and closing remarks and approximately an hour for questions. In terms of the time, each candidate, as I said, will have three minutes for their opening remarks, two minutes for each question, and two minutes for their closing remarks. Unless there are any pressing questions, we're ready to begin. It's not so easy to go first, Aid. Please start on, us now. off. Um, hello, how is everybody doing tonight? <laughs> I see a lot of familiar faces. I prepared something, but I would be lying to you guys if I read off that, so. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about my resume or you know what after graduation. Uh, I thought I had it all figured out. I went to New England College after everybody told me not to, I would regret it. Left after a semester, failed at that. Uh, came home, COVID happened, I went insane. Uh, I would walk 20 miles a day and uh, just trying to stay alive. And um, it was hard, I was home alone. My brother was constantly working and uh, my parents were stuck in Tulum, Mexico. <laughs> and uh, every day was hard, every day was a challenge until my father told me, Zade, you have to change. And I was mortified of that word, change. It was scary to me. But um, two years after that, I graduated, got my degree. Then after that, I started working with my father. A couple months after starting with him, I took over the business with my brother. And uh, a year after that, we grand opened our second business. And um, it's just been beautiful. And the only way I got there is through PV. You know, the parents who raised me as if I was their own, the teachers that would m watch me fail over and over again and offer the extra help uh, just gave me a chance to grow, really. And it's time for me to give back to you guys and to put the school first, put the people first, and listen to all of you. So Putnam Valley, please sit back, let us take over, and let us guide us to a successful path and make Putnam Valley the gold standard. Thank you. Oh, Mrs. Parmley, <laughs> sorry. I just thought you were gonna take turns, Barbara. You were a teacher for so long. Okay. Um, I, I was gonna start by saying you have a copy of my bio, but I heard that there was a printing <laughs> issue and so you don't have a copy of my bio but I, I think most people know um, who I am so I wasn't going to go over that information but I'd like to begin by sharing the characteristics of effective school boards and how and why I wish to remain part of the team I see the primary job of a board member is to commit to a vision of high expectations for student achievement through quality instruction as a member of this board I have looked at student work listened to staff concerns, heard the administration's goals and plans, 
and worked with all constituents and taken every opportunity to hear and see what's going on with our curriculum. This board shares a belief about what is possible for our students and staff. While we don't always agree on every curricular change, it is so important that we listen to one another and believe in the system and its ability to teach all students at high levels. I believe, as does this board, in accountability, and I work to remain focused on policies and procedures that improve student achievement. As difficult and, difficult and challenging as it is, this board and I have worked to align and sustain the fiscal resources that the district has to meet the goals of educating every child. Fortunately, we have a wonderful business office that works transparently, transparently to ensure that taxpayer monies, whether from local, state, or federal taxes, are protected and used appropriately and with both short and long-term planning. It's important that I and the whole board have a collaborative relationship with our teachers and staff. I have worked to better understand the concerns and needs of staff. I've served on any and all committees open to teachers, staff, and community to hear their perspectives and concerns. While it's not possible to give every group everything they want, I try to keep the overlying vision for Putnam Valley in front of me and treat all with respect and care. I work to embrace and monitor data that affects the students in the district, understanding that these are people and that numbers in isolation can be misleading. Both positive and negative data need to be understood if we're going to use it to improve our instruction. I work with the superintendent from our respective roles to ensure strong collaboration and mutual trust. He is willing to answer each and every question until I understand. As one member of a team, I work to build an effective unit through communication, training, and shared knowledge. None of us has all the answers or every point of view. Being open to other ideas and working to improve our efforts allows growth and change, and I believe that's what I do. Thank you. Ms. Hayes. Good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Alexandra Hayes. I go by Sasha, and I'm running for the Putnam Valley Central School District Board of Education. I'm the mom of a wonderful fourth grade boy, D'Angelo Semino, who currently attends the elementary school. I moved here with my family in 2020, and I've been very happy in the district. I'm a full-time working mom, I work as a and I work as a registered nurse at Castle Point VA Hospital in Wappingers Falls, New York. I provide primary care to our veterans in their homes, mostly within Orange County. I've had experience within the Putnam Valley School District by being a class mom and an active member of the PTA for the past four years, and most recently serving as the PTA Vice President. Since there have been about 200 posts on Facebook regarding my PTA position, I thought I would address it now. For those who do not follow Putnam Valley Voice, I'm going to briefly describe what has happened within the past three days. On the evening of the 12th, a group of Putnam Valley Concerned Citizens wrote an email with concern over my relationship to the PTA and the Meet the Candidates night. There was some accusation of censorship, conflict of interest, and ethics. This email was then posted to the Facebook group called Putnam Valley Voice. As much as I would have liked to make a statement, I find that every time I try to get information out there or engage within the community online, the conversation goes awry. As someone so thoughtfully put it, a lot of people take an adversarial approach and ask loaded questions to incite a debate rather than being genuinely interested in listening to an answer. I'm only going through all this because I think it'll help people in this community understand some things about why I want to run for and why I'm qualified for the BOE. Let me tell you a story about how I wound up being vice president of the PTA. Since my son has been in school, I have been a class parent and an active PTA volunteer. I have done crafts, read to the classes about being a nurse, provided ice cream bars, done science experiments, volunteered at the book fair, and so much more. I want to be involved in my son's education. I've always gone to most of the PTA meetings, which I can tell you are wildly unattended. Last year, around this time, in a PTA meeting, the previous PTA board put in their resignation and told the community that the PTA was going to go inactive if someone didn't take over. That's when a few moms and I chose to team up together to create a new board so that Putnam Valley would continue to have a PTA. For those who don't know, the PTA is responsible for the back to school picnic, the bubble bus, the book fairs, school pictures, grade level events, winter wonderland, pocketbook bingo, the yearbook, student of the month, field day field trips, assemblies, appreciation days, and so much more. These women and I selflessly, cho selflessly chose to step up to the plate and become the new board so that our children wouldn't lose out on any of these things. Regardless of what we had going on, that is to say full-time jobs, residing on other boards, taking care of sick family members, our own families, 
We immediately decided that we would make the time so that these children wouldn't lose out on so many of the fun things within the school. We've spent countless hours providing these things for our children over the past year. It really doesn't matter if I resign on May 8th or June 27th. If anyone wants to ask for more detailed information regarding this timeline, I'd be more than happy to provide it. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Good evening, my Putnam. Ooh, sorry. You take turns. Go ahead. Excellent. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, my Putnam Valley community. This is a blessed full room tonight. I don't always see this here, so I feel very blessed tonight. Uh, my name is Miranda Zaki. I am running for one of our two seats of the board of for the board of trustees. I currently have a daughter in ninth grade and a son in first grade. As a single widowed parent and a registered nurse, I understand the challenges our community faces today. I believe our school board should represent voices of all members of our community. If elected, I will work hard to ensure the educational needs of our children are a top priority and that our school district uses its resources wisely and transparently. It is important to me that everyone in our community, albeit if they have children in our district or not, that they are involved in our decision-making process related to our schools. Schools need to be accessible, affordable for everyone. Advocating for policies that help our seniors on fixed incomes and our homeowners is an important goal. Searching for funding using elected, elected representation resources is one avenue. Finally, I want to ensure that our schools are preparing our students for the challenges and opportunities of their future. First and foremost, our curriculum must meet the needs of our amazing Putnam Valley community. Our amazing students must have the best possible educational opportunities. Please allow me the opportunity to be your voice by voting May 21st, which is next Tuesday, at our elementary school. Two minutes. Thank you for all of your support. <laughs> Right, and in the interest of time, as we move forward, um, we will hold our applause after every answer. Um, we will certainly applaud after the closing remarks, but for each question, let's hold our applause. Um, we're a very affirming group. Um, so this next question uh, is really a two-part. Um, do you support the 2024-2025 school budget and in and the two um, and the related three propositions, uh, the spending plan, um, the school bus proposition, and the capital reserve account proposition. And in your answer, can you speak to your history as a voting member of for our school budget in the Putnam Valley community? Mrs. Parmley, you'll begin this round of questions. Okay. Um, by law, I'm not allowed to tell you how to vote, but I, I personally wholeheartedly support the budget and the three propositions. I think they are fiscally responsible, and I think that they have, they are the best way of using taxpayer money that protects the taxpayer. Um, yeah. So, um, and since I've moved into Putnam Valley. Um, I have voted every year in the school elections. Um, my husband has voted every year. Um, my children, when they were living here, um, vote every year. I also vote in national and local elections. Sasha? Um, I, too, support the budget. Uh, I agree that I believe it is fiscally, fiscally um, reasonable and that it um, supports the needs of our students. I also support both of the propositions. Um, going line by line through a budget is very complicated and I am so thankful that we hire someone to do that. Um, 
going through and trying to allocate all of these dollars is incredibly important. Um, and <laughs> sorry, and um, I think that the way they did it this year, um, supporting the students and the main goal of the district, they did a really great job. Um, I also have voted in every election, uh, school board, national, state, uh, since I've been a voter. Thank you very much, Ms. Saki. So I have spent countless hours on understanding and learning our school budget over the last three plus years. Expense reduction is a need. I have a list I would love to go over with you um, if I'm elected for the board. Uh, that list would need to, I would need to go over before I even talk about it with my fellow teammates. Um, I don't like to dictate to people. Uh, I would lobby and communicate with our team way before supporting any kind of budget. We are truly presented with one side of our proposed budget. I've seen it year after year. It's always the positive side. And, and you know, that's the school district's job. That is what our um, financial person does, and she actually does an amazing job, countless hours. I can't even imagine that job on our school budget. But I want latent terminology with our school budget. I want the general public, you know, we're not all accountants, we're not all, um, you know, business people that can understand the terminology that's used in our school budget. Um, I would like to see that latently explained and so the people of our town can understand, including but not limited to the younger generation, the middle generation, and the older generation. Um, I would like our debt services to be communicated. Um, I personally don't like debt. I want it, you know, that last page of the budget was not really discussed. Uh, as far as our propositions, um, the, purpose, the purchases of our school buses, I, I do um, pretty much agree with. I, um, our children need to be safe. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure, thank you. El Jamal? Um, taxes, yes. This is my favorite part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm with it, yeah. I support the proposed tax budget. Uh, last week I had the pleasure of sitting in and listening to all the new um, propositions and everything, and I, I'm with it. I think um, nobody likes paying taxes. There's no hiding that, but um, to be the best, you got to kind of spend a little um, and be understanding to the community as well, though. We have to work with what we have. You know, we have a lot of elder, elderly people in the community who are on fixed income. So when we hear uproar from them, we have to listen and, and we have to uh, kind of cooperate with them and make sure that we do a, everything that we can to make sure that everybody, no matter how hard that is, everybody is satisfied with it. I know, I know, you know, easier said than done, but I like a challenge and I know with uh, the right people surrounding me and um, if we put our heads together, we could get something real nice, drew up and uh, propped out to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next question is related to budget question, and it really speaks to balance. And there's <coughs> three different questions, but how do you balance the needs of all students and all constituency groups in our schools with one limited pot of resources? Um, and specifically, do you weigh extracurricular activities differently, arts versus sports? How do you balance all of those needs um, in creating a budget and a fair and equitable program for all of our students. And we will start this time with Ms. Hayes. Um, again, I want to reiterate that it's amazing that we pay somebody very well to come up with a budget um, who has gone over how to allocate certain funds for each one of these academics, extracurriculars. Um, there are certain regulations that we need 
to fulfill IEPs, 504 plans, and um, I believe that all those need to be covered and the money needs to go, the budget needs to cover those and um, well first and foremost. And then um, I, academics holds a very, we, I push for a strong curriculum, a diverse curriculum that appeals to a lot of different um, students. I want a curriculum that benefits the people who want to do APs just as much as it benefits the people who want to be plumbers. Um, and I believe that the resources should be spent equally on both of those things. Mm -hmm. I think that the arts are um, also important. I don't know that I would personally say that they are equally important, but I think that um, you need to allocate a budget to them. Uh, I think it's wonderful that we're able to put on plays, that we have a band, that we have chorus. Um, I think all these things really truly shape our students, and it's not just the academics. Um, and I think, I don't, I've never worked within a budget like this, but I think it's really important to have all of those things and do your best to have all of them. Um, I would hope that I could have an open discussion with uh, the business administration um, to, if I didn't agree with money being allocated um, not evenly. Thank you. Ms. Aki? So, I think, you know, we, we have so many different people, so many different programs. Um, I think we need to prioritize. And we need to prioritize by listening to everyone um, and sitting down and having open meeting discussions about that, no matter who comes to those open meetings. Um, I, I think the biggest aspect is to have voices heard and, you know, it's like if, if someone comes to you and they give you a good enough reason that they need this program or they want this program, we truly have to listen. And sometimes, you know, sitting at negotiating tables, which I've done for many, many years, um, we have to give a little, take a little. In order to get a little, sometimes we have to give a little. And that's the way it works, but we have to uh, take a look at the whole picture, not just little pieces of the picture. Thank you. It tells you more. Can you repeat the question? Sure. The question is, how would you balance, I'm not going to be able to repeat it exactly, but very close. The question is, how would you balance the various needs of all of our students and give way to extracurricular activities such as athletics, the arts, et cetera? with the limited set of resources. Yeah. I think the most important thing is making sure that every student uh, gets equal opportunity, whether they throw a football or they sing on stage. I think that we have to disperse the money um, evenly, but at the same time, it's what's pulling in money as well. You know, As crazy as that sounds, it's kind of like a business. Um, and when you talk about balance, it's like balancing a checkbook, so which I know how to do, but um, <laughs> thank God. But <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, at ultimately ultimately at the end of the day, it's it's we have to make sure that every student, every single student, is getting a fair opportunity to pursue their dreams and achieve their dreams because um, not so long ago when I was walking these halls when I got into fights in this cafeteria, it's kind of weird. Um, I, I saw kids who, who would give up before they even had a chance because the school wouldn't back them. They tried shutting down Studio 116. Mr. Mahoney remembers I fought to keep that studio uh, around and now I'm hearing such great things and we just have to make sure every student gets their fair opportunity because who are we to decide the future of a kid? You know, we're taught Growing up, you could do anything you want, right? I thought I was going to be in the NFL. <laughs> five, five, six. Not happening. But you just have to believe hard enough, and if you give these kids a chance to believe, they will work hard, and uh, they'll make sure it happens. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Ms. Parmley? Um, when you started the question about how do you balance students and c constituents, I will tell you that on a scale, the students outweigh the, anybody else, 
every day, every day, and every decision. I also understand that students can't succeed without strong teachers, great staff, amazing custodians, bus drivers, administrators, all of those allow the children to grow. And so they, they have to be taken care of also. It's also all paid for through taxpayer money, federal, state, local. That has to be taken into account. Um, so the balance can be tricky, and it, you have to keep all of those people in your head and in your heart when you're making decisions. Sometimes the decisions are hard. I do think we should be really proud of the fact that we offer a wide variety of sports, arts, extracurricular, music. We have an amazing music program. It's been recognized by the state. We have an amazing theater program. We have an amazing art program. They uh, show their work all over. Um, our students do incredible things. Um, just between now and the end of school, which is six weeks, there are at least 15 or 16 celebrations of student work. Um, so they're, again, on my end of the balance beam. Thank you. All right, our next question, and you will begin, Ms. Aki, and I'm going to give you a single quest, single topic question. It's very an easy <laughs> one. Good. I was ready or to one. <laughs> all of you. How do you, what is your awareness of, or how do you feel about our district's ability to support students with special needs? So this is um, a pretty big topic, actually, because if we go back, uh, the state has decreased our funding for special needs children. And I will tell you that um, our special needs children that we have in this district uh, deserve a completely fair education. And if we need to go above and beyond for them, that's what we need to do. I do know some of our special education um, teachers, and they are truly amazing. Honestly, uh, this is something that the district is actually doing amazing. And they're fighting this with the state. Uh, they're working very hard to beat this decrease in state funding. Our special education program stands high on our district's priorities. Our district knows and understands special education. It's not an option. It's not something elite. Uh, many children are affected, and if we take care of our special needs kids at a very young age and give them their needs, they can grow and, and prosper just like any other child. Um, and I will say I'm very happy and proud that PV is going in-house for these, for this, for our children, our special needs children. Thank you very much. Yeah. Judge Mo, same question? Yeah, um, same as... Support mm, special needs, how would yeah. you... Same as Miranda said, it's, mm -hmm. it's a dear subject to me. Uh, my sister-in-law actually is a teacher for students with special needs, so... I understand the importance and while I was here experiencing uh, seeing the teachers with the students and everything it, it genuinely like I don't want to say surprised me in a bad way but surprised me in a really good way it made me understand how important these teachers are and it's tough to see the state pull money for stuff like this and it, it's something we have to work with and make sure it stays as as good and we could keep um, the students uh, with the same opportunities to, to grow and to learn and, and, and uh, just have a chance to be the best version of themselves. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to see a state pull money and just be like, oh, okay, figure it out. But we'll fight uh, and we'll make sure that that stays strong. And I, like I said, they're doing a good job with it. I see uh, a lot of my friends today actually are uh, you know people living with special needs and hearing what they have to say about it it's 
made me made me smile knowing PV is still doing um, great when it comes to special needs. So, thank you very much, Ms. Parmley. Yeah, I I concur with my fellow candidates. Um, in the 40 years that I've been involved with Putnam Valley Schools, um, their special education programs are second to none. They take care of every child where they are. Um, and provide the programs that they need, um, provide the people that they need in order to grow and learn. Um, and I you know, wholeheartedly support, um, and I'm aware of and support all of the work that we do for them. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and agree that I think it's incredibly important. Um, that I'm very upset to hear that state funding has gone down. Um, but some things that I really love about our district and I want to make sure continue um, is that there's a variety of different classrooms that accommodate a variety, variety of different needs. Um, and the students are placed based uh, on what needs they have and what teachers are going to do uh, best. I think it's really important, especially for people with differing, abil uh, differing abilities, that we assess the individual needs of the students. Um, what might be good for one student with a specific disability might not be good for another student with that same disability. So it's really important that there are multiple meetings throughout the year with the teachers, the therapists, and the parents. Um, the parents know their kids best. They know um, what they're able to do, how far they've come. It's important to get their input and to make sure that the district is meeting the needs of these children. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah, perfect. that's it. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, we'll sit, I'll circle back to you, Mr. Mead. What do you see, and there's a couple of questions, um, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the district with regard to edu public education at this time? I think flat out honesty. Uh, honestly, I feel like it's not holding everybody accountable. I feel like there's a lot of slack given. And uh, the way I was raised was if you're going to do something, you do it the right way or don't bother doing it. Um, so I feel like we need to just hold everybody accountable and uh, really push for uh, better grades and, and uh, just better performance overall uh, from teachers and students and everybody in the building. If you walk through that door, you have to give 110% each day. That's what I expect. That's what I'm expected uh, to do when I wake up and before I go to bed. It's You give 110% and trust me, it's a lot easier once you get a hang of it. So if we could implement a way of where we could hold our students, staff, faculty more accountable and, and you know kind of put a little more pressure on them we'll start getting uh, some good results great thank you very much Ms. Parmley biggest challenges oh biggest challenge um, I I feel that our country has become divided we've become polarized and we've gone into groups, tight-knit groups, where we don't hear or listen or understand the ideas and thoughts of others. Um, I think that that hurts our children. I think it hurts our community. Um, I think we all have to be on the side of the students I always, I used to say to parents, I, I cannot do this when I was teaching. I used to say to the parents of the children that I had that I cannot do this job alone. That if we are not partners and we are not working together, your child will not succeed to the extent that they should. Um, and so I think partnership and reaching out and being more open to people, trusting people, Listening to them, hearing their voices is a, the greatest challenge we face right now. Thank you, Ms. Parmalee. Ms. Hayes? I'm going to second um, Mrs. Parmalee's thoughts in that I also believe that 
we come from an extremely divisive society right now um, and that people aren't hearing other people. People aren't respecting other people's differences. Something I am constantly telling my son is that we're all different and the differences are what make us incredible and that if everybody the same was the same, we wouldn't be able to achieve so many things because not everybody would be good or because everybody would be good at the same thing and it wouldn't leave room for people to make to excel at other things and make the world into a better, more successful place. Um, I think it's really important that um, we make the school and the curriculum um, something that will emphasize empathy, tolerance, and respect for others. Um, I believe it should include safe and support. It should ha we should have a safe and supportive school climate. Um, Academics are a big part of schools, but it's also the students' social and emotional wellness and not respecting people's differences um, makes the school a really t hard place to be in. Um, and I think it's really important that children are seen and that they know how to see and relate to other people who may be different than them. Thank you very much. Ms. Zaki, biggest challenge. So, you know, life is really busy. It's crazy busy for all of us. We don't stop. Parents don't stop. Children don't stop. Um, that being said, I think uh, we have to take a step back and really look at how we're going to build trust and amazing communication with our parents, our students, and fill in gaps that need to be filled in. I think it's vital. Because one of our biggest issues is we have a declining enrollment in our school district. Now there's a declining enrollment in many other school districts, but you know, I need to focus on home. I learned at a young age, you focus on home first and then you venture out to the rest of the world. So um, it's, it's a concern for our school district. Uh, it's one of the ways that we are funded through New York State is by our numbers and our enrollment. So why is our, our district enrollment declining? There's many factors. Um, we've had students leave to go to private schools. Um, and we need to uh, not only private schools, but homeschooling. Um, the numbers of, in, of homeschooling within uh, our county and our state is unbelievable. So we need to um, talk to the parents and we need to find a way to fill the gap and why are they leaving um, and truly listen to them and see if there's something that we can do as a district to win these children back, to win this trust back with parents and what are we doing that's causing our parents to lose this trust. Thank you. Ms. Farmer, the next question is for you. Um, um, school safety and student violence is an alarming, alarmingly frequent topic in our society. What do you see is the role of the Board of Education and the district in ensuring um, our students' safety, particularly as it relates to gun violence? Okay, um, the board hires its administrators, um, teachers, staff, um, and trust that they are trained, that they are prepared to deal with emergencies. We have a wonderful um, emergency response team is it perfect? No, that's why we drill and practice. Um, school violence is a concern, but I also feel that I don't want the students of Putnam Valley to live in a cage um, to, so that they feel always fearful. Um, when my own uh, children went to Putnam Valley, the doors were never locked. I understand times changed. Things are locked now. It makes me sad that we have to live like that. But that is, it's a minor thing and it doesn't make students feel uncomfortable. 
So school safety is a high priority, um, but I also think that it has to be done responsibly and carefully um, and trust the people that are with the students to do the jobs that they need to do. Thank you very much. Can Same you repeat question. it one more time? Sure, no, that's fine. Um, in light of the alarmingly frequent um, incidents of school violence and gun violence in schools, what are your feelings and if, what, do you, what do you believe is the role of the school board and the administration in ensuring our students' um, safety, particularly as it relates to gun um, violence? Okay. Um, I think that a lot of um, the gun violence, violence in general, um, violence between students happens because of what I discussed previously and that we're in a divisive society. There's a lot of pe people disagreeing with people. Um, people aren't feeling seen, aren't feeling respected. Um, there's bullying. I think it's so incredi incredibly important to focus on the mental health of our students, of our teachers, and um, we're gaining a counselor. I think our middle schoolers and our who have crazy hormones, who are changing, who are dealing with so many new things, um, and our high schoolers are especially vulnerable. Um, I think it's really important that we prioritize mental health. Um, I think making sure we have enough counselors um, is something that the board can be responsible for. Um, we also have SROs. We Last year, they were able to get a couple more, um, or they were able to divide, and so that there's one, two here and one there. Um, so I think that's really important. If um, just their presence can be a deterrent themselves, and they, I hope that they have been vetted, they know how to uh, be safe, know how to control situations to prevent any, um, to make sure that if there were, were gun violence, that it would be a con uh, as controlled as it could possibly be. Uh, I think the drills are also very important, but I do agree with Barbara that the drills are important, but we can't, so, so that children and teachers and everybody is prepared for what to do, but that we can't instill fear in children so much that they can't go to school. Excellent. Ms. Saki? So one thing I'm very proud of is that we have, and I look at safety as, safety is the number one priority. Over food, water, nothing matters if you're unsafe. That being said, I'm very proud that a couple of years ago I sat in Board of Ed meetings and one of the things that was mentioned was we felt we needed a police officer at the middle school. So lo and behold, each school district now has, an, each school, sorry, each separate school now has a police officer. It used to be that the high school and the middle school were sharing one, but then an incident happened and um, we came in and we said, we need a third officer and that middle school needs to be protected. Um, I, I talk to people and I'm like, well, if the teachers aren't safe, our children are not safe. And that is very, very true. Communication with our teachers and training with our teachers, I, I think could be, um, could happen a lot uh, better, uh, especially in emergency situations. Um, that's why it's called an emergency situation. It happens. And um, as far as gun violence, uh, keeping the doors locked and, and a lot of safety measures that our school has gone through, which, um, which we don't publicize for obvious reasons. Uh, I think our school is doing a pretty good job on that. And we have four nurses. And if you know about safety in a school district, nurses are very, very important. Thank you. Uh, as a former student, never felt safe once whenever we were in a lockdown drill, won't lie to you guys. Uh, felt like it was very easy for someone to break into the classroom and uh, if, if elected, I'll keep it short and sweet, if elected I have a full proposition about um, changes we can make to ensure that the teachers uh, and students are safe when in a lockdown drill. I mean, I'm looking at faces in here who are in school with me and remember we went through a bomb threat. Uh, 
a list, another list, Snapchat threats, everything. Never felt safe, not once. Didn't see the school take any jump to uh, protect us or to ensure that we would be okay. It was just like a, hey, listen, it's all right. Swept under the rug and then um, here's, you know, Pizza Dipper Wednesday. Uh, in all honesty, it was it was scary. And for violence within the students, uh, in a sense of bullying, we're gonna nick that in the behind and uh, try to stop that. Uh, as a student who, you know, went through bullying almost every day, dealt with racism, dealt with stereotyping and everything, um, it's not something I, I liked at all. And I know that if elected, I'll, you know whip up another presentation to ensure student safety as well as our mental health is you know like my fellow candidates said it's it's a it's a scary thing to um deal with and uh just want to make sure everybody feels safe thank you all right friend. excellent thank you uh, I'm going to stay in that same theme. One of these questions, which um, I can't find, but I do remember it, is um, what is your opinion and your feelings about the school district's um, role in the um, directives we get from state education regarding um, inclusion, equity, and diversity? And I believe this question begins with you, Ms. Uh, Hayes, I think. Mm. Yes. Okay. Let's let's read that one back again one more time. So, um, just what that is, end part. What is your feelings about um, and and one of many of these questions are speaking to the directives we get from the New York State Board of Education and have New York State Department of Education and how our school district operates. Um, one of the uh, directives is about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. What are your and what are your feelings? about this, how do you believe a school board should meet those, those requirements? What are your personal feelings about the inclusion of education of that nature in our schools? Okay. Um, I have never been on a school board before. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know as much as I wish I could mm -hmm. about um, the state regulations, um, which if you'll notice, you're at least going to have one person on the board who has not been on a school um, a school board before. So um, I'd love to hear what everybody else thinks about this too. But I think it's really important um, to make sure that we have that we're meeting that we're able to provide this all of the students with the same opportunities. So. Um, in terms of equity, you know, some of our students who come from different backgrounds, lower income backgrounds, um, people who come from different countries or who speak different languages, I think it is really important that we have the tools and we, uh, the board makes sure that these students are taken care of, that um, they're able to learn just as well and perform as well and be ready for college or for trades or whatever they want to do, um, just as well as people from, um, you know, high income families, people with two parents versus one parent. I think everybody deserves the same opportunities. Um, and I think it's the responsibility of the board to hire enough people to make sure, just like with the special education, that um, they're doing uh, benchmarks, they're looking at state at testing to make sure that students from all different walks of life are learning, and if they aren't, um, getting feedback from teachers, parents, students on how they can better serve the community, students. Thank you very much. Ms. Zaki. So we truly do have an amazing, diverse community on so many levels. Um, there's no exception for one person. Uh, that being said, we have age diversity from newborn all the way up to 108 plus years old. 
Um, we have ethnic diversity. We have Italian, Spanish, Irish, Indian, Chinese, Filipino, English. We have, you know, Albanian population, Arabic, Jordanian. We have religious diversity. We have Christian, we have Jewish, we have Protestant, we have Episco Episcopals, we have even atheists that live in our community. Then we have career diversity, very, very long list. Uh, we need to take a look as a team at Albany's DEI policies. We need to unite in a positive way using those policies. We can't divide and expect to divide um, It's just not going to work. So we need to find a way to use those policies in DEI to unite. Thank you very much. One more time. Um, <laughs> I wasn't up yet. I was just. Oh, oh I'm is sorry. Is that okay? Um, no, yeah, absolutely. Because I didn't so get sorry. a red card. You only gave me 30 seconds. So tonight, before I got here, and I'm going to talk really quick. Um, I was speaking to a teacher who um, teaches kindergarten in the Bronx. And she said, you know, Miranda, you know what we do? We have in our classes, I have as a teacher, we do all the celebrations of all the different students. And it brings all the different students in. And they each do something different, whether it's bring a food or wear clothes. Sorry. And I, I apologize. So this question is about um, the uh, equity policy, equity, diversity, and inclusion policy, and how does uh, how do you see the school district? What are your beliefs about how the school district should ensure that policies that we get from the state regard specifically in this question regarding equity, inclusion, and diversity are carried out? What are your feelings about that? It's, it's it's as simple as just making sure that we follow what the state says. I mean, <laughs> if they want us to be inclusion, like have inclusion, diversity, all that, then just do it. I mean, come on. It's, it's <laughs> as like I said five minutes ago, there's a student who dealt with racism in the school. All I ever wanted to be was to be like treated like a normal person. Or So just go about it if the state says, you know, be together and be a team, then be a team. There shouldn't be any differences b based on the color of your skin or the language you speak or where you come from. This is Putnam Valley, last time I checked. We're a family, right? We're a strong built community. So let's just keep doing what we're doing. And if the state says, listen, you need to add three more people to this of different races and stuff, do it. I mean, it shouldn't. you shouldn't have to do that anyways. It should just naturally come, but let's just keep going. Let's be welcoming to everybody. Let's try to change and be welcoming and give everybody a fair opportunity, All right? Okay, DEI is close to my heart. Um, I agree that we are a diverse community, um, and I think we can celebrate that diversity with, without isolating people. Um, equity is a tricky thing because it doesn't mean giving everybody the same. It means giving everybody what they need. Um, and so for some it may be more, for some it may be less, for some it may be today, for some it may be next week. Um, inclusion, I can't think of anybody who could object to including everybody and not isolating or separating anybody. Um, but I will tell you that in Putnam Valley, one of the things, ways I listen and hear people is I have been on the DEI committee since it was formed. When it started, there were probably 40 to 50 people, teachers, staff, parents, and students. The last DEI meeting that I was at, which was a week or so ago, there were seven people. People have stopped talking about it. They've stopped thinking about it. They're busy with other things. Um, if the state says do it, I agree with Zaid. Why, 
we're doing it, but we can't do it alone. It's fine to say we should listen to everybody, but if everybody doesn't come to the table, it makes it really hard to have a discussion. Excellent. Okay. Somebody uh, check me. I believe we're starting with Ms. Zach, uh, Zachy this time. Did everybody answer yeah. Yeah. the equity question? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to read this as is. Discipline is a significant concern in the high school and the middle school. I have heard teachers, students, and parents complain about behaviors and the way the administration handles these incidents. As a new board member, what steps would you take to bring order and discipline to our secondary schools, both middle school and high school? And I believe Me? we start with you, Ms. So, um, you know, we're growing up in a world that is changing. Uh, I can give you an example. So, I, I, you know, I know the school seems to be a little more lenient and handling discipline a little bit differently, and they want to use it as a learning experience, and I'm all for that. However, um, you know, children today have to be children today. They can't just talk to an adult, albeit a teacher, a monitor, a janitor, or do anything that they just want to do. And I personally think we need to have a discussion on a little bit more discipline than what's occurring. Um, you know, we need to be a little more strict than what we are. Sometimes I'm driving around the school and I'm looking at the way children are dressed or, you know, um, I hear a lot of words out of the mouths that shouldn't be happening. Um, we need to get the parents involved and we need to have a discussion with the parents and the children. Uh, I think that's a big factor. Again, there's a communication gap. We need to fill it. Thank you. One more time, please. Perfect, Sorry. Fine. No, and I'm, that's why I'm trying to read some of these as is, because I know I'm yeah. paraphrasing many different questions. Um, discipline is a significant concern for this writer. Discipline is a significant concern in the middle school and high school. Teachers, students, and parents all complain and have concerns about the behavior and the way our administrators handle these incidents. As a new board member, which step, what steps would you take to bring order and discipline to the middle school and high school? I said it earlier, you just have to hold these people more accountable. There has to be a repercussion to your actions. Um, simple as that. It's You have to kind of uh, demand more from your students. If, if behavioral and attitude and everything is an issue, then you got to sit them down and address it and create a plan where you could present to them, right? They might say, hey, you know what? Maybe I do need a change. Maybe you need to talk to these kids with a little more stern tone and uh, tell them the truth. Hey, bucko, you're slacking. Mm -hmm. Just tighten up. And it's, it's about holding people accountable. I feel like growing up, um, I'm thankful I had very strict parents in a sense of they just wanted me to be the best I could be. And I don't understand why nobody else would want that. So I'm not saying everybody doesn't want that. But the students who are misbehaving and being disrespectful or even the parents or the teachers you got to look yourself in the mirror and see like you're not you're not the only person here um you really got to do better and there has to be action and trust me when elected when i am elected i will make sure that the school tightens up whether it's the students staff administration whatever it is that's you know, I was, as a kid, I was told, you know, I was expected to give my best every day. So I'm going to hold everybody accountable to that as well. Honesty. This is going to be a little tricky. <laughs> um, I have been in all three buildings, different times of the day, different classes, um, assemblies, lunch. And I think we have an amazing staff and students. 
I do not see disorder. I do not see disrespect. I don't. And I'm in the schools as often as I can be and in classrooms whenever I can. Um, it's fine to say, handle it. I would handle it differently. It's, it's different when it's your child. It's, and you don't always know what the steps the administration or the psychologists or the social workers have taken in order to help the student who is struggling. You don't know. It's easy to stand on the outside and say, well, that child should have gotten this. Or if I had been in charge, they would have gotten that. Um, you don't always know. I think we have tremendous administrators and staff. And I think that they do an amazing job. Um, and if you've ever had a child that was struggling or in trouble, and you went to them, you understand maybe the process better than somebody who's standing on the outside just looking in. Thank you. I have strong opinions on anti-bullying. Um, I don't want to say that I was bullied as a kid, but I did experience unkindness. And um, I think that it's really, I struggled with it. Um, and I think it really, it makes children, it, it affects children's confidence. It affects, and that confidence affects their ability to perform well in school, to create relationships. Um, and it's just really terrible for the students. Um, I think it's important that we gather information about harassment, bullying, and discrimination at the school directly from the students. We can do this through surveys. Um, or other mechanisms, we should analyze and use that data that's gathered to assist in de decision making about programming and research allocation. We should establish clear school-wide and classroom rules about harassment, bullying, and discrimination consistent with the district's code of conduct, which we have and it's available online. Um, we need to continue training with, for teachers and staff. And con um, one thing I think is incredibly important is to learn about and identify and teach um, teachers, counselors, everybody, um, to identify the early warning signs and precursor behaviors that may lead to harassment, bullying, and discrimination. Once we, once somebody finds that in a student, we need to make sure that it is addressed with um, the student, their parents, counselors, teachers, um, to make sure that they don't get to that point of bullying and that we don't need to, um, deal with that discipline. When it comes to discipline, I think it needs to be a board decision. It can't be the decision of just the principal. There needs to be other input. People, you know, the social worker, the psychologist, if things have, um, if they've been getting those services, they need to look at what happened and determine appropriate punishment. We all bring, uh, each of you bring a number of personal connections and experiences to uh, the role, uh, will bring to the role of the Board of Education. How does and will your political affiliations with any political group or religions, and some of the examples were given, Democratic Party, uh, Republican Party, specific churches, Moms for Liberty, um, NRA, affect your decision making as a board member working for the Putnam Valley Board of Education? And you go first. Um, I said it in my opening statement, I'll put Putnam Valley first. That's all I want. Uh, heart to heart right now. All I want is this school to be the top. You know, I didn't come here my whole life, go to every class, just to watch it, you know, kind of slip away. Like, I want this school to be the best, and I won't let anything outside affect uh, what goes into the school. So, my beliefs are my beliefs. The school is the school. You know, we'll just have to wait and see if, they, if there is something that comes up and we'll have to wait and see when that comes, but I'm 99.999% sure that nothing will ever interfere with my decisions and the board and the school district. Um, school comes first. School, everything else, so. Thank you. Pardon me? Okay, so um, 
15 years total on the school board, 45 years living in this town. Um, I'm curious whether anybody knows my political affiliation <laughs> or my religion. Um, I, I mean, other than close friends, like it's not something that I bring. I didn't bring it to my classroom. I don't bring it to the board. I don't bring it to school. I don't, it does not come into my decisions. My decisions as a school board member have been always with putting the children first and what is best for students and my personal beliefs have nothing to do with it except for my belief in the fairness and justice for all students. Thank you very much. Um, I don't believe in bringing religion or politics into schools and I won't bring it to the school board. Um, you guys are really lucky. I am not affiliated with any groups. I also, people would not know how I vote um, or what religion I am. And um, I'm, none of that would impact my ability to be on the board. The only thing that I am affiliated with is the PTA. So whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, my experience on there will probably come to the school board. Excellent. Misaki? So um, I've said it before in Board of Ed meetings, and I felt strongly about this since the middle school yearbook came out. We have to keep the politics, the political affiliations out of our district. Meaning that if we're sitting at a Board of Ed table or we're doing something in the school, we um, cannot bring those political uh, thoughts or any of that into our children. Our children can be affected by political views very easily. We have a very vulnerable population. Children are included. And no matter what your political views are, it needs to be kept out of the children. I will say this. There are some um, very strong political uh, organizations that um, not uh, not involved as a, as a board member, but that may come into our meetings and they feel strongly about something. And I think it's up to the board, the administration, to work with those political affiliations, no matter what, or the political organizations, no matter what those political organizations. We've had some good things come into our school district such as parental right advocacy from political organizations. And I think we have to clearly look and have an open mind related to those political organizations. Okay. Thank you. I, I, was that one whole question? Yes, okay. I'm sorry. It, it, they're beginning to blur. Um, okay, um, this is related to an earlier question. Um, um, underage drinking and cannabis use and vaping is a significant issue, accounts for a high percentage of our discipline problem in our schools. Um, what are your feelings about the role of the schools in terms of both prevention education as well as addressing these concerns? And Mrs. Parmley, I believe you begin. Okay. Um. Anything that's against the law is against the law in school also. Um, I think those um, rules are fairly clear. I think um, everybody, students, staff, um, understands them. Um, I think we have, a really, we have some really good programs in terms of helping students make good choices. Um, I think our, our health department um, and our health teachers do a really good job of explaining the dangers um, to students. Um, I know that the PTA and the PTSA and um, other groups have brought speakers in to talk to students about the dangers of making poor decisions. Um, and I, I think that the policies and, and student handbook rules um, are, are fairly clear and um, I, I can't think of anything that I would change in them to make them clearer. Um, 
and you have to hold students accountable for breaking the rules. Thank you. Ms. Hayes? Uh, I agree with the sentiment. Um, if it's illegal uh, to do, um, it should be illegal at schools too. I agree that they should be held accountable. Um, there was an issue in Children's Center with a fourth grader um, with vaping, and I think it's a really big issue, um, especially when it's affecting our really young population. I think it starts at home. I think something that's really important, which I would seek to do, is try and get parents more involved. I know um, they try to do after-school programs for parents to give, to talk about the dangers of vaping or um, social media. Uh, I think it's really important to continue to do this, continue to make the outreach to parents, try to instill good values on um, the students, v vaping and all of that. It's, it's new. Um, it's easy to bring them into school. The rules are set. We need to, they need to abide by the rules. And that's that. Thank you. Ms. Zaki. So I'm pretty strict on this. There needs to be a zero tolerance policy. Uh, you know, kids are curious. There's a lot of peer pressure. We all went through it when we were younger. However, when we were younger, the drugs that are out today compared to what was out when we were younger are 10 times more potent. Um, you know, there just needs to be an absolute zero tolerance for the behaviors that are associated with, with drugs and alcohol in the school. Um, and if a child has a problem, we need to intervene as a district. Um, and by intervening, we need to pull in the parents and uh, it needs to go back to the parents. Um, they need to deal with it, whether it's you know, bringing it to the attention of the child's doctor, psychologist, what, whatever needs to be done. Um, I come from a long line of experience with um, drugs and alcohol, uh, not me personally, thank God. Um, I will tell you I did try it when I was 16. One time, marijuana because we're all curious, right? I ended up in Vassar emergency room. My mother was the charge nurse because I snuck out of the house. That's the day I learned I never touched another thing after that as far as marijuana, alcohol, and drugs go. So there needs to be a zero tolerance. Um, I started working in the, in the emergency room when I was 17 and I'm 50 now, I'm a straight up person and I never really left the ER. Uh, my mother made me work there because of that one night incident that I snuck out of the house when she went to work. So, uh, you know, my poor kids, they, they have no chance to be trying these things. And, and they do a lot of sports. I keep them in sports because I heard a mayor once say sports keeps them out of the bad stuff. True. Great points by everybody. I mean, it's, <laughs> how do you expect a different answer? It's zero tolerance. If you're caught within school, I feel like there should be instant action taken uh, to punish a student. Um, it's not good for you. Uh, and in all honesty, I mean, listen, I was in high school. It is really easy to get it in the school. Uh, all three, you know, I remember all three substances that were brought up. Uh, vivid memories of what happened with them. Um, it's really easy to get into school. I feel like there's no real way you could check a student and prevent a student from bringing it in other than educating them while they're still young. And, um, you know, see something, say something type of thing. Uh, it's, if you see students vaping, it's, it's all right to just be like, tell it's administration or, or uh, Sorry, because, uh, no, monitors, sorry. Monitors uh, report them and everything and just keep it going. You know, it's, it's something that shouldn't be in our schools no matter what, no matter what I have or what you have or anything, it shouldn't be in the schools. And for the parents aspect, I feel like the parents really need to be educated on the stuff uh, that is in question, um, marijuana, alcohol, THC, uh, tobacco. The parents really do need to get educated before making assumptions and everything. So, 
It's a little bit of both, but it's absolutely zero tolerance. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, this is um, a, a two-part question. Um, so to be effective, the Board of Education must work together as a team with all school staff. Please share an example of how you've collaborated with individuals in the past six months effectively, including those with differing opinions. And related to that, how do you get more parents and community involved in working as a team in light of our very poor voter turnout? So this is about team, working as a team with our school district, and how have you worked as a team member? And I believe Mrs. Hayes, oh, you begin this one. Okay. Um, I have been on the PTA board for the past six months. Was that um, right? oh. And <laughs> I have worked with a group of women, which let me tell you, we all have different <laughs> opinions, and we have worked I think incredibly well together. We actually, most of us didn't know each other. We weren't, um, we come from all different aspects of life. Some of us, we each have actually, we have a child in each grade, which is really cool. Um, we've been able to listen to each other, respect people's differences and come to do and um, host so many events, so many um, teacher appreciation, the book fairs, um, we've done so many of those things and it's important to hear each other out. It's important to, um, I'm not always right, so it's important to be able to admit that and to um, take what other people say and to come up with what the best thing is for, I mean, in, for the school board, for what, um, for the students, the teachers, the taxpayers. Um, it's important to listen to everybody, take everything into account and to make the decision based on that. Um, I can work as a team, uh, in a team. I'm a team player. I'm nice. I'm approachable. Um, I think those are all really important things to have in a team member, and uh, I think I'll bring that to the table. Ms. Saki? So team building is extremely vital. Communication with the entire team, including all of our staff in the school, is vital. There's different ways to approach this. Um, as you know, not only just in our schools, but even with parents. Um, parents, teachers, staff members, teacher aides, housekeeping, we need, our school board needs an open policy. Meaning that if someone wants to communicate something to us, we should not hold anything they tell us against them. That's part of trust building. Um, there's a lot of trust that needs to happen with building a team. We have, uh, and I talk to a lot of people, trust me, I'm on the phone all night long because I don't sleep. And one of the things that parents tell me so often is, well, I don't want to go to a board of ed meeting. And teachers too. I can't, I can't talk to them. They'll hold it against my children. We need to demolish this thought process and build the team again. Voting is very vital. Not only is it your right, um, we need to teach our children at a younger age how important voting is. So when you come to vote on the 21st, because I know everybody's gonna come, Bring your kids, they get a sticker, they love it. Excellent. Um, repeat the question one more time, please. Yeah, I was hoping you weren't gonna tell me that because I forgot I um, <laughs> what it's, question it's, it is. I'm, I'm getting nervous lot. with the time. Uh, how would you create uh, work as a team? Um, how do you, uh, working as a team member, I found it here. Working as a team, a board is very important. Give some examples. Have you worked effectively with this team, and how do you involve Got it. the entire community? Got it. Most definitely. So um, <laughs> to keep it short and sweet, uh, I've been very vocal across all social media, reaching out to uh, parents, parents, uh, the youth of Putnam Valley, and much more. Um, I'm always in Putnam Valley, Cortland Manor. So I uh, get to ask a lot of questions and hear the feedback of uh, a lot of people. And 
to keep it short and sweet, uh, just know the youth voters will be there. So we will have a large turnout. The youth voters will definitely be there on May 21st from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the Putnam Valley Elementary School cafeteria. You're sharing my thunder. I'm going to say that at the end. Good. <laughs> Mrs. Parmley? Um, I have to say that um, the Board of Education and the administrative team that comes to board meetings is probably one of the most amazing group of people who all have a vision for students. Um, I would like one example of a time that a parent spoke about something that happened to their child and we took it out on the child. I, I hear that rumor a lot. It just doesn't happen. Um, we are not, we do not hold people's ideas against them. We may sure. disagree. We may, but we listen respectfully and we do not hold it against them. So like the rumor that we do is just not factually true. Um, I, I would like to get more parents involved always. I tried as a teacher. Um, it was very difficult. I've tried at a board, as a board member. It is even more difficult because there are more students. It's 1,500 students instead of 20 or 24. Um, but we have not ever turned parents away who have an opinion or an idea that they want to share. Okay, thank you. And did that begin with you? You did. I say so. Okay, thought so. Okay, um, I'm going to throw in two more ones quick. Um, how do you feel about our secondary language exposure in all of our schools, and is there anything that you would change? And Ms. Aki, that's yours. In all of our schools? So. Yeah. Yeah, our, our secondary oh, our education me? language. Um, so, yes. Um, so, secondary language. Secondary language is important. Uh, and I'm going to correct myself, it may not necessarily be a secondary language, but uh, languages other than English that we teach in our schools. Other than English, like Mandarin and, and um, Spanish. So, you know, years, a couple of years ago, I, came, I was at a Board of Ed meeting, and I did ask, um, you know, why are we teaching Mandarin? Why don't we have Spanish? Because Spanish in the United States of America is the number two language. Um, and I think with the way that, that America is headed now, uh, it still is um, even more so that Spanish is a very important language that needs to be offered to our young children. Um, I do understand that Mandarin, and, and they did answer my question, as to Mandarin is the number one language in the world, um, is, is one of the, the second biggest language in the world. So um, I did a lot of research on this, and I feel our students in the elementary school could benefit from Spanish much more than they could from the Mandarin language. Thank you. Let's keep it going, yeah. Uh, so, what is no, uh, no, 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 you got no, it? No, no, I got Sorry. it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> Golly. Gee whiz. Um, uh, it threw me off now. Uh, the second language is very important. As somebody who speaks two languages, it's something that I can't stress enough. It's something that we should really implement uh, at all ages. Because, like Miranda said, it is uh, America's very diverse, you know? Why don't we cater into it instead of, you know, backing away from it? So let's keep it going. It's good. Um, and I feel like as the students advance properly, uh, they should have more options and to mm -hmm. explore more languages, which we could look into down the line. Simple as that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Parmley. Okay. Um, I would agree that learning a secondary language, even though I'm not good at it and can't do it, um, is, is a great benefit to students. Um, 
We started the Mandarin program because BOCES offered us an opportunity to op open that window with kindergartners and then stretch it to first and second and third and fourth graders one, you know, every year. Um, BOCES provided the teacher, BOCES provided the equipment. Um, so it was a great opportunity. We've both BOCES and Putnam Valley tried, had the plan for doing it in Spanish and starting it at the elementary school, but they cannot get the certified teachers, they can't get, BOCES can't get the people. We don't have the money in the budget, it's one of those balanced things. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't instituted it yet, but it's not off the table. It's something that we talked about several times at board meetings. I will say that through the middle school and high school, we had, I think I attended maybe 15 Seal of Biliteracy presentations this year. Um, three years ago, I think it was one. Um, students are stepping up and taking the challenge of proving that they can read, write, and speak in a second language so that on their diploma they get a Seal of Biliteracy. Um, the, one of the board student reps um, started the Chinese National Honor Society in Putnam Valley, which was just this year. So we are doing really well at incorporating second language in our schools. Um, I think second languages are really important. And from all the research that I've read, um, the earlier you expose children to languages, the easier it is for them to learn. Mandarin is not only a different language, it's a different alphabet. And I think it's a really great program that we have. Um, the Chinese, China makes up an incredible part of the world's population. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to become more prevalent throughout the years. Knowing Mandarin and having exposure to it at a young age, I think, is incredible. Um, I personally don't have very strong feelings over uh, Spanish or Mandarin in the elementary school. Um, I'd be willing to listen to the arguments for each side. Um, language in general is important if we can't afford it, but we can afford the Mandarin. I think that's great. That's really important, and we should stick to it. Um, if we can get Spanish as well, that's even better. If we have to choose one, I'd listen to what people want. Um, in terms of the middle and high school, I think it's really great to get that biliteracy. I was reading about that, and I think that's awesome. As Miranda said, Spanish is incredibly helpful. I can tell you, working in the Bronx, um, I learned Spanish at a young age. I remember songs about the body parts. I would work as a nurse, and I would say, escucha tus pulmones, you know, from <laughs> learning all that from when I was 10. Um, it's extremely helpful, and uh, I think if we can bring it to the schools, we should, and uh, more languages is better. Okay, so this very last question is combining a lot and is really um, setting you up for your closing remarks. So um, as we've talked about this evening and as a lot of these questions have indicated, um, there is a great deal of balance and a large time commitment on, that is involved in serving on the Board of Education. So what makes you a good candidate for the Board of Education and what do you feel your greatest challenge will be stepping onto this board? Uh, answering emails. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I want to hear everybody's voice, everybody's opinion. So when I am elected, I will open an email specifically for comments, concerns, and questions uh, from the community. I feel like that will be my biggest challenge. But uh, I love challenges. I, 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 could, I could sit here and talk about challenges for hours, honestly. Um, but no, I, I mean, when I say something, I mean it. And if you know me, you know I, I hold my word. And my word has value to it. I will stop at nothing. Nothing will interfere with me making sure that Putnam Valley is the best. So uh, short and sweet, that's it. I will stop at nothing to make sure that this school is the best. I'll, all ears 24-7. Actually, no. Um, 2 AM, not available. Don't reach out. <laughs> Um, time commitment can be challenging. Um, I give, a, I spend a lot of time in the schools because this is what lifts me up. Um, the programs, 
music, concerts, um, elementary school, read aloud, whatever it is, um, seeing the actual faces of the children that I'm serving is just the best um, feeling in the world. Um, I know that I have the luxury at being retired of being able to do it when people who are working can't, um, and that's fine. When it, whatever you can give in terms of a time commitment is a blessing. Um, I also serve on the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association as a director because I know that we are not in isolation here in Putnam Valley. We are part of a larger community of schools, and I can learn from them. Um, I also serve on the Lower Hudson Education Coalition um, as a director um, to advocate um, in Albany for things that we believe are best for students, as well as the New York State School Boards Association. So, um, you know, that's, that's my commitment, and it would remain so. Thank you. Ms. Um, as mentioned before, I have balanced um, the PTA board, which when I've spoken to a couple of the Board of Ed um, members already, it sounds like the commitment that I had been making all day, every day to the PTA would be uh, pale in comparison to what the um, Board of Ed requirement would be. I think I'd be able to manage it and um, my son is the most important thing in my life and I would be willing to, like I did last year, to make the time this year because it's important and I want, um, I want to say in his education. So even if it takes the time, I'm willing to expend it. So I just run, run, run. It's not a joke, <laughs> okay? It's not a joke. But that being said, I, I'm a full-time mom. I work full-time. Um, and that was Monday through Friday, anywhere from eight to 14 hours a day. And I still found, found time for everything else. Um, and uh, recently, I had to evaluate on how I was going to decrease that time. So I got in touch with our lovely governor of New York State, who um, added widows to Fidelis Insurance. So I am no longer going to be that full-time working mom. I am going to be per diem at the hospital, which I can make my own schedule for the first time in my life. And I don't have three jobs anymore. Um, I only have one job per diem at the hospital. And my two angels that I make sure I make it to all their games if I can. Sometimes I have to send some friends because they got games going on at the same time. It's truly heartbreaking. Do what you got to do. Um, but you just find the time. And I think as a mom who's had to balance both mom and dad priorities, I just built my son's bedroom, banged out walls, did it all myself. So we just do it. We do what we got to do, and we don't complain. OK. All right, that leads us to later than I said we were going to end, but I said 8.30 to 9, so I'm right in that time frame. And I know you just finished answering that question, Mizaki, but we are going to begin our closing remarks with you. Um, again, there's two minutes for closing remarks, and I think we should applaud each of our candidates at the end of each of their remarks. I have sat back there to meet the candidates nights four times myself. It is not easy. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, and Mizaki, if you can begin with your closing remarks. Thank you. So uh, to begin with, I want to thank our PTA for their countless hours of work on um, having this meet the candidates night. We're very fortunate to have this because not all school districts do. Um, I want to thank all of you who have taken the time out of your busy schedules to join us tonight. Voting is a crucial investment in our school district. And my heart is filled with warmth to see so many community members investing time in the future of our children. I am grateful for this opportunity to explain why I believe I am the best candidate and choice for one of our two Board of Trustee seats. I have spent many evenings here at our Board of Education meetings over the past three plus years. 
I have spoken up many, many times. I know by speaking up many outcomes um, that have come that have been positive from speaking up and using my voice. My resilience is one of my greatest strengths in my personal life, as well as my professional life, as well as a voice for our community. Every step of this journey that brought me here tonight is an amazing step. Uh, I love truly listening and honestly to our community members. It's encouragement for me to keep going. If you give up, what do you think we're all gonna do? We're all gonna give up. Um, I thank all the community members that have joined me at my home over the past several months. On the phone for hours and hours, you know who you are. And at my dinner meetings, real time, true life experience. Thank you. Ms. Hayes, you're in this direction. All right. I hope to bring the perspective of the private sector to the school board. It's public knowledge that the school board primarily consists of members from this community that have been involved in schools before, either as teachers or administrators. And as much as I love our teachers and administrators, I think it's so important to have a diverse school board to reflect the diverse needs and opinions of our taxpayers. I think it's wonderful that there are um, teachers and administrators that are familiar with how things work within the school districts as board members, but I also think that there's a, new, a need for a new face with new ideas. I want to be a voice of the people with no ties to the education system, the administration, or the teachers union. I hope to bring the perspective of a mother, but also the perspective of a frontline worker. I believe that my career in the healthcare system will bring new ideas and considerations to the board. There are so many things I love about our schools and our school district, but I believe there's always room for improvement. As a school board trustee, I will advocate for a diverse curriculum that fosters love for learning. I will strive to re retain teachers who make a difference. I will support small class sizes. I will be an advocate for mental health support within the district. I want to focus on trying to get families more involved in the schools, which is re re directly related to increased student achievement, decreased disciplinary issues, and an improved school environment. I want to be a bridge between the parents and the school district. My son is involved in scouts, 4-H, and multiple sports, and I encounter tons of parents. I want to be able to hear about issues from community members and address it with the board with the goal of resolution. I look forward to being part of a team of caring individuals hoping to provide a safe space for all of the children. Um, since I didn't get to touch on it, I also want to say that I want to hear from the teachers. Um, when I was being interviewed uh, by them, the, um, they were talking about how the, they didn't always feel safe to bring forward their issues. And I think it's really important because I relate to them on the front line um, because they're right there with our students. I think there needs to be a way to get the concerns from the teachers uh, without fear of retribution. So I also want to seek to do that. Mrs. Parmway. So I'd like to thank the PTA for hosting this event. Despite unfounded criticism, they stood for transparency and community in providing this forum for questions and information. The process of voting on the school budget is an institution unique to the United States. It's an important way to ensure our public schools are responsive to the needs of their community. Voting shows democracy in action and serves as a great example to our students of knowledgeable, engaged, and thoughtful citizens. I'm asking for your vote to keep my seat on the Putnam Valley School Board. I will continue to serve the students, staff, and community of Putnam Valley no matter how the election turns out, but I feel I can be most effective as a member of the board. I fully support each of the budget propositions. The budget is again below the tax cap and protects current programs and allows for future plans. It is student-centered and reflects the district's core goals of community, opportunity, resiliency, and empowerment. These aren't just words, they drive and sustain our actions. The proposition to open a capital reserve savings account costs nothing and over time provides the safest use of taxpayer monies. The proposition to allow financing for district buses also has no tax impact and costs nothing, 
but allows the district to receive the best deal for taxpayers in case we need to purchase a bus. Please play this vital role in our democracy and vote on May 21st at the elementary school between 6, and 9, 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. or pick up an absentee ballot or an early voting ballot. Thank you. All right. Um, to the people that are scared to believe in me, I get it. Change is scary. Change is a really scary thing. Like I said in the opening statement, I was afraid of change. Now look, all right? It's okay to be scared of change. It's okay to be scared. It's quite normal, actually. Thanks to the PTA as well. And um, to the people who believe in me, the people that know that I... This mic isn't working. Yeah, it's really good. Hold on, hold on. Test, test, test. All right, so the people who believe in me, the people who know that I, Zayd El Jamal, will stop at nothing to make sure that this school is the absolute best, thank you. And to the rest who still are scared to change, What's there to be scared about? Come on. Thank you, guys. OK. So um, I, I also want to extend my thanks to the um, Putnam Valley PTA for giving um, the community this opportunity. I will repeat what each of our candidates has said at least once. Voting will take place on Tuesday, May 21st from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at Putnam Valley Elementary School in the cafeteria. Voter parking is available right outside the cafeteria entrance doors. There are three propositions on the ballot. Proposition one is the budget spending plan for the 2024-2025 school year. Proposition two is asking the community for permission to borrow money to purchase school buses if they are needed. And Proposition three is asking the community for permission to open a capital reserve account. All budget information and presentations, as well as absentee and early mail voting, is available on the district website, pvcsd.org. It is a two-step process. You must, must fill out an application and then get the ballot. An application with an original signature must be completed and received by the district clerk, who is Lo Maureen Bellino, who is located in the district office behind the elementary school. The application is available on the website, or you can stop by the district office tomorrow, Friday, or Monday between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. The time frame for mailing ballots has ended. Thank you all for coming out. And have a good evening and good luck to all of our candidates.